Welcome everyone to our latest installment of Leader to Leader. My name is Erin Kirshenman, and I'm the Managing Editor of Wine Business Monthly, and I am just absolutely delighted to be joined today by Dale Stratton, one of the pioneers for wine industry data, consumer insights, and market analysis. Thank you for taking some time out today, Dale. Thank you very much, Erin. I'm honored to be here. Now, for those of you who don't know Dale, he has been influential in the business for more than 35 years, spending most of his time linking consumer, shopper insights, and market, market analysis with business objectives and strategies, essentially bringing data to life to help businesses make better decisions. Um, he spent time with Gallo, with Constellation Brands. He was the president of the Wine Market Council, definitely one of our industry's most important resources for consumer research and market data. Now he is with Azer Associates, and as I was looking through your bio, Dale, one thing I did not realize was that you had a bachelor's degree in journalism. So um, welcome to the club. It's a fantastic Thank group. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Yes. Now, so I read your bio, but in your own words, tell us who you are. What title do you think best represents the type of person and leader you want to become and are? Oh, thank you. That's a great question. Uh for me, the, uh, the the background makes you who you are, and and I was very very fortunate uh, for my first job out of uh, uh, university to be a, a Gallo sales rep uh, in Denver, Colorado, uh, and got that classic Gallo training, and and that just stuck with me as I as I went through uh, a very good structure on on how things are done and and, and how you do them. The importance of um, uh, the importance of understanding that not only are you selling wine, but you're selling things that sell wine, and that you have to have that appeal to a, a shopper, have to have that appeal to a consumer, and that you've really got to think in those terms and look at it through their eyes, and um, and then the analytic. Uh, um, uh, avenue that I took really came through category management. When I was at Gallo working with uh, national accounts and uh, category management was kicking off and I always just felt it was important to know more about the tools that I was uh, using than, than the person I was presenting to. So got deep into that and, and fortunately with Gallo, they gave me many opportunities to apply that and that led to leading insights teams. And you know certainly the uh, the fundamentals of of um, leading a insights team are are very very similar to what you're going to do with leading a sales team, leading a marketing team. Uh, but but you also have to just make sure that your leadership style is consistent with 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 uh, with what you're doing and what what your team is doing and what's important to them. Uh, so you know I like to think that. Uh, um, you know, going way back that I always thought my role as a leader, especially on the insights organization, was less about coming up with answers and more about coming up with questions. What are the questions we need to answer? Where are we going to go? Uh, we have a whole bunch of smart people who work for us. They can go get answers, but you've got to make sure you're asking the right questions and that and that uh, your business associates, be it marketing, sales, finance, production, um, that those are the questions that they're looking to answer. So uh, I always just thought that 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 was my role as a leader from an insights organization was making sure I had the right questions for a group of really smart people to go leverage the resources they had to go answer those questions. That's something that we've been hearing a lot about, whether it's through this leader to leader series or when we're talking with managers or HR, um, it's finding that intellectual curiosity, right? Knowing what the questions are, wanting to know more. And honestly, as a manager, sometimes realizing that you may not know the answer, right? Or even if you do know the answer, it's encouraging your team to figure it out themselves. So I'm really excited to hear you say that. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, I uh, used the quote that, look, uh, life life is an open book test. Uh, and, and so sometimes you're right. You don't have the answer, but you better know how to go get it uh, and make sure that you're able to do that. But but you're right. The the idea that you're going to know everything about uh, everything just doesn't exist. So make sure that you're able to really leverage the resources you you have and and uh, get get to the right answer and and and, and make sure that it's consistent with the direction that your company is going as well and what's important to the to the company that you're working for and 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 driving along with their goals as well. 
Absolutely. And that's a good lean into this next question. Um, you know, one of the things that we always have a harder time with, and I, I actually, I shouldn't say that, it shouldn't be a harder time, but we sometimes have really long discussions about what a leader is. What does leadership mean when we're coming up with our list of, you know, 40, 50 individuals? Um, so, you know, sometimes we say it's just people who go out and do it and just say, you know what, no one else is, I'll be the first. And other times it's encouraging others. How do you define leadership? I think, you know, I think the the, the key thing in leadership is empathy, um, is is being able to really um, take a step back and look at look at what 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 is that individual that you're that you're uh, that you're leading, that you're working with, um, what what is important to them, and what are what are they seeing, and what are they feeling? Now I can start to to talk about what that means and and how that goes. Um, honesty is really key, and um, I think we've all probably worked for um, good news managers who. Um, everything's great. Everything's going to be great. Uh, and, you know, I always um, like to use the phrase again that, you know, like uh, everybody's going to have to eat their vegetable. We'll get to dessert um, and that's going to happen. And, you know, we're going to eat the entree, but, but you're going to have to eat your, your veggies there, right? You're going to have to take that unpleasant part that's there because it's going to be there. So let's make sure that we understand that up front uh, and, and address it now. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's not going to be pleasant. However, uh, we're going to certainly get get you to a 60% good days versus 40% difficult days. Uh, and uh, boy, the way things are right now, that, 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 that's a really good situation to be in, right? Absolutely. And, you know, looking at your career and what you've done for the industry, it looks like you've had a lot of those really good days, definitely at least the 60% rule, right? Um, tell me a little bit about, you know, actually, if somebody were to ask you for advice, right, um, what habit or practice would you say maybe that you engage in daily or weekly or however long to attribute to that success? What do you do to make those that 60 percent good day possible? I think I think um, more so than anything, Aaron, I try and start with yes. Um, and and that, that whatever it is that's posed to you, start with yes. Uh, and 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 how do I get to yes? And and uh, you know, realistically, again, um, in my career, very very fortunate that um, I was asked uh, to to move different places, take on different roles. Um, and and uh, I always started that with yes. Like let me, you know. Um, when I'm, when I'm living in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time to move to Modesto, California. Do I really want to do that? Well, you know, there's some things that aren't going to be great, but I always started with yes. Yeah, let's, let's go do that. And starting with yes, I think really helps you get there. Um, and there's always going to be people that are going to be the voice of no. Uh, but start with yes um, and, 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 and get yourself there. So I think that that, to me, is something that really keeps me uh, excited about the industry, keeps me going in the industry is starting at that point. And I, and I know there will be uh, a lot of people who know me uh, who hear this are like, he is he he's lying. He's crazy. <laughs> right? uh, I can be the voice of no. There's no question about that. Uh, and oftentimes deliver bad news. Um, but but my orientation is really to always start with yes. Well, tell me about one of the times somebody said no to you and uh, some of the challenges that you've faced in your career. How did you overcome those? The, well, um, f first and foremost uh, is, um, is I, I would say, the um, uh, listening skills. Let me, let me, okay, you said no. Let me, let me understand what, what no, what is driving no? And let me get to that understanding of, of that which is driving no. And I would say really the, the, the biggest no that I ever overcame um, was not in my professional life, it was in my personal life. And that was when I tried to convince my current wife that um, she should move from Orlando, Florida to Houston, Texas with me without getting married. Uh, that we're just gonna go live this one. In. And she's like, mm, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> and, uh, so it really had to listen there and uh, uh, I, I guess that's not really a good example of overcoming it because because uh, uh, we're married and that's that that's what facilitated that was she 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 stood her ground and that's where we ended up so 
uh, but it was important to listen, to understand, and also know I'm not going to win this one. Right. So now you have a different now you have a different choice to make and what what's important to you and and uh, and make that decision uh, based on that. You're not going to win everything. Uh, so make sure that you uh, make the best of the things that you're not quite going to win and, and and move with those as well. That, that is a kind of a fantastic lesson, though, because I know there's so much fervor and zeal once you have an idea or, or an ambition or goal in mind that you just want to run full force into it and and remembering that you have people that you're bringing along with you, whether that's your spouse or your employees or a company. So I, I think that is actually a fantastic lesson that you can apply to the work life. Absolutely. It is. All right. So I want to change up a little bit. Um, and I hate to be the Debbie Downer here, um, but you've kind of alluded to it already. You know, wine isn't exactly where we would like it to be. Um, sales are slowing, consumers are changing. Um, you've been in the business for quite a while. Tell me, what are you feeling? Where, how has, have we shifted? Yeah, the, and I think, you know, the in the in the larger, I think first of all, start with the larger context. And um, I can remember um, interesting going back to when I was first started at Constellation Brands, and we're building a deck to go to a retailer, and we're trying to convince the retailer that they need to further support the wine industry. And we're putting together a projection on where we think the wine industry is going to be in 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 ten years, whatever. And we we came up with this. Um, like 45 billion dollars it's going to be a 45 billion dollar industry and we're all like man that's crazy we're, you know, we, we can't it's not going to grow that fast sitting here today at a 70 billion dollar industry right when you look at that in in, in consumer sales we're like 70 billion dollars so the greater context of this if you look at it over the 20 years it's amazing how um, strong this category is and how big it is uh, we, we've now reached a point where we're a mature category. The wine category is a mature category. Population bases in this country are not going to grow dramatically. Um, so as we start looking at it, it's 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 we're, we're not going to generate the kind of growth that we did. The business doubled in a in a twenty year period. That's not going to happen again. So, uh, but what we are seeing is a continued. Uh, push up in the business, right? And um, for a person who sold a whole lot of Carlo Rossi and a whole lot of Gallo Chablis Blanc and Red Rosé, as we move through this and you look at it, the, 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 the market has really moved and, and the wine industry is in a different place. Uh, it's a fabulous industry to be in. Growth is not going to be what it is. Growth is going to come in a different way. Uh, and and that's what we have to adjust to. And that's what we have to understand is that um, we're, we're just in a different place. We're a mature industry versus an exploding growing industry. Um, uh, barriers to entry in this category are a little more daunting than others. Um, however, the amount of virtual virtual labels and virtual brands that are out there, the, 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 there's not a huge barrier to entry on those. And th those areas are going to be difficult. Right. That's going to be a more difficult place than we've been. Um, and the traditional um, uh, land, owning vineyards, uh, estate, those things are going to continue to become more important. And that's where the consumers go. So uh, there's there is good news within that volumetrically unlikely to grow, uh, but certainly from a continued dollar growth standpoint, uh, the category is likely to continue to do that. Well, that's fantastic news to hear. And I thank you for putting it all into perspective. It's very easy to fall into the doom and gloom of the headlines. Um, I hate to say it, but one of the first things I learned in journalism school, and you probably did too, um, was the phrase, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> if there's bad news, that's what people are going to be automatically drawn to. So you put it at the top, right? Yeah. And, and look, we, you know, in, um, you know, interesting coming out of a sales background, you, you, you know, you were in the trenches battling, battling, battling. And it was interesting when I started seeing another side of the wine industry, when you come out here where you're helping your neighbor, right? You're, you're the, 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 the wineries that, that is, you know, and I've always, uh, 
you know, the winemaker, like, look, if, if my, my pump broke one year, my neighbor knows it might be their pump next year. We're, we're, we're going to, we're going to help each other out here. Uh, and so it's, look, it's difficult when you, when you start seeing, you know, some of your neighbors not doing as well. Uh, and, and that's a situation that we're in. Uh, so I think, um, uh, it's, it's not going to be an easy, um, three to five years here. Um, uh, but, but we're, we're again, um, on, on the whole, it's a it's it's a great industry that will be able to experience some growth. There's probably just going to be a little bit bit of a change on um, who's winning and who's losing. Right. And, you know, as we look at the current wine consumer, um, we talk so much about bringing new consumers into wine. Right. Our major audience are older. They're moving into retirement. Unfortunately, as Danny Breger pointed out at Unified, they're passing away at a fairly alarming rate. Um, you know, how do we start from, from your perspective, how do we start bringing in those new consumers who are more concerned about say health and wellness, um, where they're, what they're putting into the body, where the food and beverage they're, they're drinking is coming from. What do we do? Yeah. The, you know, the, 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 I think the good news that, um, at the base of this is we have a great story for that consumer. Um, it, 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 it's an agricultural, very clear agricultural product. Uh, there's, there is not a, a ton of intervention here in, in, in what, what we deliver from the time that becomes a grape and the, the time it gets to your bottle. Um, uh, the, uh, um, the people who are in the industry are, are fabulous people. So our story to tell is really good. We, we just have to figure out how to tell it a little bit more differently. And I, and I believe we have to do it at a more macro level. Um, we're very good at telling um, small stories um, and, you know, individual wineries, individual growing regions, counties, but we don't really tell a story about wine as a, uh, a, a as a product on the whole. Um, I, so I think that that's a, that's a really big um, opportunity. I, I do want to say, though, that it's also don't don't underestimate how hard this is. Um, how do you how do you appeal to a brand new audience without alienating your core audience? And um, you go talk to any marketer, right? That 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 is a, that's an, an extremely difficult place to be. Uh, you've got to appeal to your to your new consumer base and your up and coming, but you have to do that without alienating your your core consumer base, and that's what I think we need to do. Right? Talk. Have you seen any brands or companies that have done that really well? Appeal to both. You know, um, I I think that, and I. I haven't done any work in that space. I will tell you honestly. I think that um, I, I think that um, I think there's a lot of people out there that are putting out kind of a you. It's not ubiquitous, but it's it's a consistent message. And this one's probably a little uh, near and dear to my heart. But you know, um, uh, myself and two colleagues on Tuesday, um, another rough day in the wine business. Aaron, we went to the Arch and Tower tasting room. Uh, right, these are two. Uh, my friend Pat DeLong and Ed LeMay, who I work with at Azure, both ex-Robert Mondavi employees, and then um, my time at Constellation, like, okay, hey, what is, you know, the Robert Mondavi wineries being remodeled? Uh, let's go to the Arch and Tower. Uh, let's see what this is. And, you know, they, they, I think that what they're doing with that brand is fabulous. And you go in there, uh, there's a sparkling rosé in there that was really approachable and really easy to drink. Like, hey, that's a good idea, right? Um, the space, right right where it is in, in downtown Napa. So I think they're, right, that's an example. They're doing some things. And, and when the Robert Mondavi Winery um, uh, reopens, I, I, it's going to be a very different experience. I'm confident. And and some of that will be about that. What what does that what does that look like for for today's consumer and making it more appealing? So um, that's an example more than anything, just top of mind because I did it on Tuesday. Uh, uh, but but you know the, 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 those things are are happening and and that's going on. So I think that those are uh, an example of of something that can work. It's hard. It's really hard. It is difficult. And, you know, Robert Mondavi obviously um, has a, a 
is a larger brand, a more well-known brand. So um, I, I look to them to maybe start the trend and then others will, will start to pick up on it. I have to say Tuesday was a really tough uh, day for the industry because I was also looking at a brand that is doing something similar. I was looking at Gundlach Bunshu. Um, oh, yeah. They have the new brand Gun Bun. Um, and it's, yeah. a, you know, lower price point on the shelves. Beautiful label stands out. And I, I love that they kind of leaned into the fact that nobody can pronounce their name and just said, you know what? No, we're not going to try to do Gunlock Bunshu. That'll be for our higher end wines. Gun Bun is the fun supermarket brand. And it, it attracted me. I'm that target audience, sort of that target audience. I wouldn't call myself a regular millennial. Yeah. Not not after 12 years in the industry, but there you it go. got my attention and it was fantastic. So I'm hoping that more wineries and brands start to pick up and do that same thing. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, we, we could probably roll um, 50 people through this that will all have an example of something that they've seen, right? Yeah. That, that, that Yeah, on a grassroots level, people are doing that and they're working hard towards that. How do we... How do we do that as an industry? How do we unify as an industry and really start to talk about that? Excellent. Well, I just want to wrap up with one last question for you, um, continuing to look to the future and whether that's you know for future leaders, uh, the future of the wine business. If you had to say that there was one area that the wine industry should look toward, whether that's technology, sustainability, diversity, the new consumer, um, what change would you fight for? What piece of advice would you give to help move the needle? Mm. Um, you know, I think it's going to go back to the fundamentals of leadership. And for, first and foremost, um, back a little bit to that empathy, see our category through a consumer's eye. See our category through the eye of that consumer and who they are. Understand that, that the um, plethora of choice that that consumer has in front of them, um, it, it, and, and I say that, first of all, there's so many more for like RTDs, seltzer, right? We've seen uh, hard kombucha, uh, you know, um, THC infused. All of these things are coming at us. Um, uh, so under, understand that, but also simplify the buying experience how do you make sure that that you you make this easy for a person who's new to the category and and um you know i've always said that those of us who love the category we're you know we're gonna we're gonna pour somebody new something that we love uh that's generally going to be red with big tannins um a new, a new right if, if you if you've not been consuming in this category that's not going to be appealing to you a light, something with a little bit of residual sugar on it, some bubbles in it, that's going to be appealing. You know, there's a reason Prosecco is the one category that is still growing through all of this, right? 5% growth rate, really easy to drink, a little bit of sugar on that profile, right? So how do you how do you think about it in those terms and, and really think about that from the consumer standpoint? Um, the consumer, the, it, it's going to be all about the consumer, uh, but I would also say, Continue to um, continue to lean in on smart people. Um, our industry is loaded with smart people. Um, how do we how do we leverage that, and how do we continue to make sure we're bringing in um, new talent um, that's smarter than we are, and and that, and that are better than we are, uh, so that they can continue to build on on the traditions that that um, uh, uh, all of these folks who you know, 30 years ago, decided it was a good idea to buy a plot of land, put some grapes in and make some wine. Uh, that, that to me is where we really have to look. Excellent. Very wise words. Thank you again, Dale, for joining us today. I always learn something new and exciting and fun when I talk to you. You as well. Always great. Always great to catch up. Perfect. Well, um, I will, uh, again, thank you so much for joining us, Dale, and thank you to everybody for joining us. Please uh, make sure to check out the rest of our video series on Wine Business Monthly's YouTube channel. Thank you, Aaron.